Hello, everyone. The European tour is back. It felt like a million months, but it was only just three weeks. Uh, and we have returned on the European tour for the Austrian Open. So for those that remember, uh, when golf was restarted on the European tour, Austria played host to back-to-back -back European tour events um, to kind of get the swing of golf going again. So it is very nice to kind of return that favor, get Diamond Country Club back in the rotation. Kind of an interesting course. Um, this is European tours, picks and bets. This is Skylar Hope talking here with my man, Tom Jacobs. Tom, what's going on? I'm good. It's been a it's been a uh, a tough weekend of golf for for me personally. We're just watching uh, Hideki win when anybody else winning would have been a great result for me. But uh, you know he deserved it in the end. I think even even with the uh, with the rush stretch at the end. But uh, hats off to Wills Alexoris in his debut. Brilliant uh, brilliant effort. And uh, your guy Bob McIntyre. He was uh, he was loved on the old broadcast over here. So uh, he did well, didn't he? I think was it was it the most birdies of the week. Uh, he was right there. Hovland, I think, edged him out a little bit. But, um, yeah, Bob birdieing 18, uh, you know, that's that's the clutch things that kind of go a little bit unnoticed. So, yeah, but, I mean, Bob's week, I think, was even overshadowed by your boy uh, podcast uh, guest, Will Zalatoris, texting buddy, some would say, uh, yeah. for you and Willie Z. So, no, that was an awesome week. Two strong debut top performances. I mean, the Masters, it was you know, it delivered. It finally got tight there in the back nine, uh, really late, but would have loved that to keep going. Now, uh, this is a, a great stretch so that we kind of get on the European tour. If those that, you know, follow it religiously, like we do remember these events from the start, they were much weaker fields. Golfers weren't all that certain on traveling into the different countries and, and kind of wanted to prioritize. So this event, uh, this two event swing got kind of, um, some wide open events. And that was Mark Warren who actually won this, which was just kind of out of nowhere for what Warren was. He has now since had a, a pretty spectacular season over the last little bit. Um, but I think what this course brings and before we even get into some of the golfers is just a different style. I mean, you think Mark Warren, you think Ashen Wu, uh, you know, Miko Kohonen, you know, you get these type of golfers who aren't the typical ones that we've been kind of backing lately that might be just the pure ball striking type, bomb it off the tee, get close with the wedges and hope the putter cooperates. It's a little bit opposite with both those golfers. So before we get talking about the top of the leaderboard, uh, what's your thoughts on the course? Well, th there was three events that kind of stuck out to me as correlations. Uh, the KLM Open, doesn't really matter where it's played, the course changes all the time. Um, but uh, made in Denmark as well, uh, seems to pop up, and so does the Volvo China Open. Uh, Ashen Wu has won in China, won here, and uh, and the KLM as well. He was tied 23rd in Denmark. Riesberg has won this, second here as well, and won the Made in Denmark. Of course, he's won Denmark. Warren's won both. Um, Chris Wood was second to Ashen Wu at the KLM, won the here and was fourth in China. So there's plenty of those sort of things to go for. Adrian Atwey was second and tenth in Denmark, second in here and second in China. So those are the sort of courses that I've been looking at. Um, like you say, it is I think when you look at guys, we've been we always look at strokes gain approach, right? And and it's always kind of an indicator of how well someone's striking the ball, but maybe not suited to the test that we we play, whereas distance is king, really, isn't it, for for a lot of the time. And and I think this is one of those weeks where it's really going to pay off having that uh, that big accuracy here. And, uh, and I think our selections will reflect that towards the end of the show. Yeah, it seemed like a pretty simple process, truthfully, kind of just looking at golfers who have performed well here and, and what they do. And it was just pretty simply, you know, they are better than the average at hitting fairways. Uh, you know, we, we like at, at FTN daily, we kind of go into the weighted driving accuracy. So how many more fairways are you hitting versus, you know, the field average for those weeks. And, you know, the golfers that perform well here are often in that top kind of 75 percentile. So top 25% of the field for that. And then they just hit their irons. Well, you know, you don't have to be gaining as many strokes off the tee. If you're hitting the fairway, you do well the, with the irons. And that literally spit out a list of golfers who, you know, have, have really racked up 
the top tens here at this course specifically. I mean, you look none other than Yus Luton, who has just an incredible course history. So until 2020, where he finished 18th, which to him probably was a disappointment being that he hadn't finished outside the top seven at this event in the prior decade. Um, so that just kind of says everything you need to know, in my opinion, about what's to attack. And when we look at this event in particular, the other thing that it says is this thing could be pretty wide open because we see one of the most talented golfers on the European tour, one of the Belgian bombers in Thomas Dietrich leading the field at eight to one. Yet we know Dietrich has not come through on a Sunday yet on the European tour. So I think that provides a lot of opportunity for some of these longer shots. Um, is there anybody at the top of the board that you're pulling on your card? Yost was the closest. Um, and like you say, Tom Dietrich, you, Jeff said it on, on, the, on Pat Mayer's show that, you know, you, you're kind of back in potential at those odds. And and there is that with Dietrich, but eight to one is is short i don't care really the field strength i mean eight to one is the kind of thing you attribute to like dustin johnson and and people like that and and he's never been that guy um matthias schwab excellent iron player obviously in his home country you would expect him to go well he's like 16 to one and it's and it's tough you know kurt kitiyama we've been talking about an awful lot 20 to one there's players there that i think could easily win sam horsfield but I just think there's so much value to be had elsewhere. I just think that you can go from 50 to one downwards and there's there's guys that have got the same profiles of those guys at the top have actually probably won more um, and they're longer odds. And, and for me, like you've got with the Heritage this week on the PGA Tour and like you've just said there, there's no secrets. You know the guys that play well here. You know where they've played elsewhere that's similar. You know the course when they put together here. It it just makes perfect sense to me and there's there's half a dozen picks at 50 to one and bigger that I'm happy to uh, put my hand off. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I think the, the case in point is even when we were debating, betting like Guido, I guess not debating. I, I was betting Guido in Kenya. <laughs> I think no I convinced debate, a there? lot of other people to bet Guido in Kenya and he almost did it, but the guys ahead of him were like Kitayama and Harding and Guido was like 25 to one. You know, when you look at this, there's nothing wrong with Schwab, um, you know, but again, profiled around a little bit better golfers than what we saw in Kenya when his odds were the same. So do I think statistically that he fits here? Yeah, absolutely. Do I, do I want to back it at 18s? No. Um, I think he's a great DraftKings play. Um, you know, I think he makes a lot of sense safety in that, but um, yeah, I, I'm going to be keep dipping down um, pretty deep. I mean, you're going to be the one that starts us off with a former winner on your card here, but I'm even going to go past that. So I'll let you talk about this next guy that's uh, topping off your card. Yeah, I mean, Ashton Wu for me, I spoke about him on the top of the show. He'd won, he's won this event, he's won the KLM, he's won in China. Three you know, perfect events really for that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really know what else more you need to say. I mean, he's a former winner of the event, won two courses that I think um, show up well. He strikes his irons well at courses that suit. Um, earlier in the year, I, I think it was Saudi that I kind of put him up as, as an outsider for DraftKings, and, and Pat was pretty happy with him uh, catching for his team. And and I think that's the type of player he is. I think you know he's a three-time European Tour winner, which not a lot of people in this field can say. Um, we've just been through the, the top guys. I mean, will I be surprised if Thomas Dietrich and Matthias Schwab win this week? Of course not. You know, they they've got bags of talent. Uh, Sam Horsfield will obviously being contention you'd think but i just think that you know a, a number over here was 50. i'm not sure the, the number on him there but he's just he's just an awesome guy and 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 at the at the rate that he wins against this field strength is uh is a pretty good number I think. yeah and, and again you you simply talk irons accuracy woo long term that that is what he does and it doesn't shock it to see, you know, in addition to his win, another 10th place here. Um, and just that that ability that he does have to, to get into the mix on Sunday and you you trust him in that sense. So for me, um, I, I think we're going to now align on the next golfer. Um, I, I thought overall there was some interest in Nino Bertazio a little bit in front of this guy. But when I when I look into it, the, the golfer that has a correlation win to your point, 
a golfer that was 12th in his last time out that is incredibly accurate, that has a seventh and a second place here, his previous two attempts, and again, fits that same mold. I was rather surprised that, you know, we were able to get David Horsey into the 60s here in the States, Pond Open. There was books that were into the 30s. I saw him as low as 33 to one this morning. Um, so to see a 66 or even a 60, I was more than happy with on uh, David Horsey. Again, he hasn't played in arguably two and a half, three months. Um, I, I just think, again, if we're sticking to a profile, we talked about this with the first event back of the European tour when we backed kind of a specific type of golfer, one that had a good short game, one that kind of made sense that way. That was arguably one of our better weeks we had when we kind of fit a mold and we stuck with that for our entirety of our card. And that's what it is for um, uh, David Horsey, in my opinion. Yeah, and and not to, to labor on a point, but he was another guest that we had in the podcast. And, and we sort of said to him after he shot the 61 in Saudi, but like how tough was it to put the clubs down uh, and not be playing for X amount of weeks? And he said, like, yeah, okay, you know, you, you do often want to strike while the irons are hot, uh, you know, no pun intended, but also he was actually quite grateful for the break. And he plays, he played really well out of lockdown last year. Um, he knows which course he's going to go to. He can circle X amount of courses every year. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, you know, he's first and second place finish in Denmark, took top six of the KLM, seven, second, seventh and ninth here. And he was second in approaching Saudi. I mean, there's, there's really nothing. I just don't. I don't really understand the price. I get the 33 to one. I can understand why people would be put off, but then you've got to take into account he's a four-time winner as well in the European six time, six time winner overall. So again, I don't make the same point over and over again. There's not that many people in this field that are like there's guys that are a bit further down the field and more experienced at one more times, but you know, winning is everything. And, you know, he's done it. He's been there. He's done it. He's still young enough to, perform like that level he's shown it in Saudi um and this is just of course you don't you don't back David Horsey at long tracks where he's going to pretty struggle but when it's accuracy then uh, then take him on yep absolutely um you know if we go into somebody that you mentioned um had a win in China um if I, one of the fondest memories I actually have is this was really close to um, when DraftKings started launching the European tour. So this wasn't, you know, a, a regular occurrence that we got these type of contests week in and week out on the European tour. And the Volvo China Open, the year that Alexander Bjork won, was like the largest European tour contest they offered. And during that stretch of golf, during those couple of years, Bjork was, as the European tour liked to tweet, the best iron player in the world. Somebody that, you know, was leading strokes gained approach in their statistics that, you know, was better than what the top person on the PGA tour was, of course, adjusting for those strengths in the field. There is a difference, um, but I I'm pretty intrigued that you're going back to Bjork here. Yeah, I mean, he's been uh, ninth, 18th and 8th in three of his last four starts in his straight gain approach. Like you said, he's won that China Open. He was 19th in Qatar in his last start. Um, and I just think, I just think it's the course that will suit him. It, he's, he's someone that really, actually, you kind of, I always attributed a good short game. So I thought he was a great passer, streaky, hold a lot when he needed to. Um, and that's kind of been his downfall at the moment. So if he can get that back up to a reasonable level uh, and take advantage of these irons, then this for me looks like a great, uh, great force fit for him. I mean, there was, I think Ashen Wu was probably a stronger case and, and they're similar price. So if you just took one over the other, I'd understand. But for me, I just thought there was plenty of value. The guys are so short at the top of the betting. I just thought there was a couple of guys around here in Wu, Horsey, and uh, Bjork that really you could just start your cart with and go from there. Yeah. And, and I went with another one who was, you know, a two time winner last year, a golfer that we backed in the second leg of the Kenya events, a golfer who ended up missing the cut that week, yet still performed well with the Irons after carrying over a really strong ball striking week the week prior. Eighth place finish last year for the American John Catlin. Um, I, I just think Catlin being a part of the range of golfers around, I'm a huge fan, you know, of Will Besseling's talent. You know, I'm a huge fan of Kawamura, you know, golfers kind of that I would view in this range, you know, and I just think Catlin has proven to be a prolific winner across all of the events and tours that he has played in his day. 
uh, whether that was the Asian Development Tour, of course, the Asian Tour, he played well during some of the mini tours here on the state side. So I think Catlin, for me, you know, is somebody who, when you get in the deeper odds, and again, yeah, if you look at six wins he had from 2018 to 2020, um, you know, again, not the strongest of fields, except Valderrama was was a really, really good one um, for him. And that to me just screams, I'm trusting the form to continue to pop. And if he's in there, that I, I think he can, you know, really make some noise. And he's more than accurate, you know, recently. So I think Catlin kind of fits those tick marks for me with the odds. The only thing for me with Catlin is I think that he thrives when it's tough. Like when you look at Valderrama, when you look at the Irish Open, which, you know, he just likes tough setups. I know he can go low and he does take advantage of, of those uh, those weeks, but I just think that he may like it a little bit tougher than what he might get here. And that would be the only the only downside. Like there is there is nothing else. Like everything you say makes perfect sense. Um, I think people still view what he did last year as luck as opposed to, you know, just getting hot for a couple of weeks as opposed to actually being his level, which, you know, there might be a case for that. But I, I think the odds don't reflect the type of talent he has shown to be in a short period of time. Yep. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Um, and then to me, um, we're going to align on one more deep one. I, I'm starting off um, in triple digits here for the next one. A golfer that Similar to Catlin, obviously not with the the winning side of things, but a golfer that I think places more or top tens more than uh, the odds really give it reflective. And this was interesting because he wasn't priced in on bet three, six, five to start the morning. So it left some of the American books kind of on an island trying to price up Sebastian Garcia Rodriguez a golfer who did incredibly well back-to-back -back weeks um, in Kenya. I mean, if you look at his performances, you see that, you know, in addition to really good irons, it was fourth and 14th place finish for him and a fourth place finish last year. And again, is that a simple way to pretty much, you know, decide on a golfer good form recently, good form here in the last event? Sure. Um, but you know, if you look at what Garcia Rodriguez has done, you know, he had 2019 was spectacular in my opinion for him, you know, six top three finishes in 32 events, five other top tens did that again with three top tens and 20 events last year, one for three so far, uh, in 2021, including, you know, a 14th place in that other event. So a good stretch of recent form and, and again, he just seems to sneak his way onto leaderboards more often than not. So at hundred to one, again, getting that each way, if you talk about a 25 to one for a top five finish, that is something that I can get behind with, with a golfer that seemingly in that first page of the leaderboard more than he should be as his price he sets. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's a, he's a fantastic talent. He's someone that we probably haven't seen the best of yet, despite the fact that he's played some great golf and yeah, you know, the price certainly, you know, responds to that. Gonzalo Fernandez Casano. Um, we talk about people having a win record um, that far exceeds their price. He's a seven-time European Tour winner. I'm not going to make the same point again about the people that haven't won and, and they're above him. He was hitting the iron so well, backed him for the first leg uh, in Kenya and he missed the cut. And then he came right back and played really well for the second week. And uh, in the two weeks he made the kind of three week stretch, he was second and first in strokes going approach. So if he can get that putter working, which has generally been a hallmark of his game uh, back when he had all those victories, I mean, he's at uh, you know, the 15th and the 21st place finish of the course. He's a KLM Open winner, um, two seconds in China, 18th in Denmark in 2019, when he really wasn't in great form. And he's really steadied the ship now after a really tough time out in America. Um, and for me, I just thought he was a big enough price. If he hits the irons anywhere near what he's been hitting in recent weeks, and um, then this is going to be right up his street. Because I think, I think what he was doing in those weeks uh, with his irons didn't really, not not suited because obviously hitting good irons works everywhere, but it wasn't as advantageous as it would be in this event. I think that's uh, really key. Here. Yeah, and, and again, I think when we look at this event as a whole following a mold of what we're looking at with some of these deeper guys who have shown abilities to place win over the European tour stretch or are really accurate, you know, good iron players that can get there 
or maybe we just go out of left field with this pick here. And it's somebody that Tom, I'm going to convince him over the next, you know, 90 seconds here. And it's a golfer we backed for both weeks in Kenya, who then got uh, an appearance, you know, in Austria to open up and, you know, made the cut, nothing all that spectacular, but, you know, the challenge tour reigning winner and Andre Lieser, um, what Lieser has done on the European tour over those two events, um, you know, in Kenya wasn't anything all that great, but there were extreme flashes, you know, a pair of 66s to kind of, uh, you know, set a pretty good ability to make the cut. He battled for the cut that second time. I mean, 66 would have been tied for, you know, like a top 20 round on the day. Same thing uh, when he did that on Saturday, actually more like a top 10 round of the day. And then he finished uh, incredibly well for the Magical Kenya Open, where that included an albatross when he went minus six in a four hole stretch in that final round um, to really light things up um, and have what I think he had a second best round of the day to Sebastian Garcia Rodriguez on that Sunday. So I think the price for the talent, the back to back winner to close out the challenge tour last year was the fourth place the year before has won on the uh pro golf tour as well i I just you know that that overall talent that he possesses i will take another shot at the 150s 125s he's out there too more than okay with that i'm just not giving up just yet tom i think i said in my podcast that he'll probably win this week after me giving up on him after a three-week trip but um like you you reckon said a six under through four holes stretch i mean you know they're all professional golfers they can all kind of do that but it kind of shows what talent level we're dealing with i know he's slightly older than someone that you'd think of as a european tour rookie but you know, he's got this funky little golf bag with his uh clubs on <laughs> the outside and yeah you know he he's, he goes things a little bit different and i think sometimes that pays off and and like you say um, if he is going to get a win, but this is a kind of friendly event for, for first time winners. And yeah, I think that, you know, it's a mixed bag. You do get experienced winners, you do get kind of rookie winners. And I think that coming out of the little break that we've had, um, you know, guys that feel like they should have been in the Masters and, and never quite got there, been used to getting there, there at the top, um, you know, that there's, there's different types of people and different types of motivations. His goal ultimately is just to be on European tour for as long as possible because I don't see him being a PGA tour talent, but he can certainly forge a fine career on here. So there's a lot of motivation for him, um, and, and that's plenty enough to uh, to take him. When you get to, we say it quite often, when you get to 100 and 125 and bigger, you know, you, you don't need to like a lot about them to, to really go all in, you know, because not a lot needs to happen, right? You know, if they can get that each way place and, and pay you. 20 to 1, 30 to 1 or whatever. And um, it's better than taking on one of the, the certain seats from the top. Yeah. And, and that's what, uh, you know, I think these events represent. And to say that, you know, Schwab down, arguably, if, if those guys win, we will have better odds if one of our guys places than the outright winner for that. And I think there's just as likely, if not, you know, significantly, I know by the, percentage is it's not significantly yeah. more, you know, but it, it, in a field base, it, it does present that opportunity. So um, I'll let you talk the last golfer that you're on because we're both on this guy. So it's Ashley Chester's. And I remember being at the open championship in 2015, I think it was St. Andrews. And that's still his best finish it was tied 12. It's still his best OWGR uh, ranking finish, but he's, He's a good talent. He's a really good player. And we just spoken about Fernandez Castaño and how his, his strokes going to approach him which should come to the fore uh, in this event. And that should be exactly true for Chester's as well. Um, he's been 7th and 28th for this event, which is obviously a positive. 9th in Denmark, 15th for the KLM, so it fits all the courses I like. 14th, 10th and 7th in his last three starts in strokes going to approach. And... And that's just something that he's been crying out for a golf course that, that suits out because it, it can be a bit way with the tee. His short game isn't always the best, but when those irons really matter as much as they should be this week, and he's got a really scorable front nine and, and par fives are there, he should be able to take advantage of the way he's hitting the ball. Um, and I think he's 150 to one uh, and, and similar. You know, the, the potential he hasn't realized yet is there. Um, and I think he's the type of talent that if he does get a win, 
he could kick home from that as well. Yeah, when, when accuracy is brought up at any course, Chester's is one of the first golfers. You know, I also think like when they mention Aaron Rye, for example, like like Chester's is somebody that puts to the fairway, pounds greens. Um, I'm still bitter that the rain caused a shakeup at the 2018 Valderrama Masters, uh, where he lost out on Sergio. You know, if you look at the score, you know, Sergio blitzed him, lost by, you know, one by seven strokes over Chester, ended up finishing fourth. That was also the week Brooks Kepka won the CJ Cup. And that would have been like one of my favorite doubles I had that week. And it would have, you know, maybe, maybe bought us, you know, a nice little, little car or something had yeah. Chester's decided to win that week, but he'll, he'll make up for it. If he can win, you know, at the one fifties and two hundreds that are presented, uh, I'm going to go with two more golfers. Uh, I'm going to go one that is another similar mold. One of the more accurate guys on tour, a golfer who popped up at Kenya, a golfer who popped up the first time played here. Um, and that's Darius Van Driel. Um, again, European tour, I guess, you know, not too much experience despite being 31 years old. Um, Tom, can you recall where Van Driel's best European tour finishes? This is a trivia question. I'm putting you on the spot. Is it going to be the year I'm bank? Nope. Well, from let's, let me, I, I know this one, unless he finished second there, then this is not. So let me double check. Should have I done my research more? No. So he has not had, he's had one second place finish on the European tour. You're in bank. He won on the challenge tour. So that was, I'll count that as, I'll count that as a success as your answer. But how about the best finish he's ever had in the European tour? So Belgian knockout. Who won that week? Was it Guido? Yes. Guido beat him (laughs) in the championship. See, it all goes back to Guido. Sad he's not teeing it up this week. Um, but yes, I mean, I remember Van Driel just fairway after fairway, you know, he does that week in week out. He takes it low though. He's got some birdieing ability. So I'm a big fan of Van Driel. Again, he's available in the one fifties as well. Uh, more than happy with him with the place odds. And again, placed at this same event last year, coming in good form, accurate golfer fits the mold. Last one here. Um, this is getting deep 500 to one. Hmm. If for those that, you know, did quarantine projects, a lot of us picked up a ton of different habits for Tom. It was interviewing, you know, a professional golfer on lost for words every other week for myself. It was diving into every single thing for the mini tours, you know, mm-hmm. in the United States being played as much as possible because the outlaw tour was offered on DraftKings. That was actually, I miss it. I miss it dearly. And, um, it still runs in DraftKings. If you're listening, please offer us more contests. We would love that. Uh, or even a Monday qualifier contest. We would love that. Those would fill. We, me and Tom would make sure they fill, <laughs> but this golfer arguably had the best mini tour season of anyone, um, you know, littered with, with wins, went on a stretch of, of four wins and five events with the other event. He finished second, was doing it in Florida, was doing it in California. Um, and then he had a spot start on the European tour last fall, um, golfer by the name of Austin Batista, little guy real little guy. And Batista was in the peak of his form um, when he played that event. He ended up finishing 40th, but he lit the world on fire with birdies. I I swear to you, he got in the top five at one point. Um, And, you know, that week, again, a weaker field at the South African Open, but it just showed the upside he possesses. Um, You know, he's not in the same type of form right now as what he was when he went over to South Africa. But I really think that talent he possesses is worth a top 20 bet, Um, you know, 500s, you know, with the each way you're getting 125 to one on that. Um, I just think this kid is incredibly talented, took some time off of professional golf, made his way back last year and just has been, you know, on a resurgence since. So um, that to me is somebody in that situation I'm always going to back. Uh, because 500s, you know, you don't have to throw much on it to to really make a huge payday. So Austin Batista round out my card for the week. I just find it incredibly hilarious. He's such a little guy. And his name's Batista. It just makes you think of this, you know, big wrestler mm-hmm. and you know, Guardians of the Galaxy. But, yeah. Um, look, like I said to you before, and like I just said here, it doesn't matter at this point. If, if there's any one thing that you like, if it's the fact that he literally made a shot that you remember that stuck in your mind and it's 500 to one. It really doesn't matter. You know, there, there's just so much you can do at that price range. You can top 20, you can top 10 it, you can put him in your DraftKings teams. People are not going to pick him. He's 0.1% owned. You know, 
And it, you know, like you said, he showed the talent at the South African Open. It's not like he he turned up and played terribly, and then everything he'd done the mini tours didn't matter anymore. You know, but he had that one chance. He he finished top forty. He played much better than top forty suggests, and and that's a massive thing that we we kind of have to do. It's like when you see a missed cut on on the form line, everyone kind of goes, "Well, we played rubbish." And no missed cuts are equal. There's guys that miss a cut by one. There's guys that miss a cut by eight. And you have to really, you do have to delve into it because it's so easy. You look at like Patrick Cantley as, as an example. But he played terribly last week at Augusta. But he's been absolutely awesome leading up to that. He's the perfect mould for the heritage. And people are just going to strike a name for him because he's 16 to one and he's missed a cut. Well, this guy's 500 to one. Um, and he didn't even miss the cut when we're talking about the Europeans. So, yeah, I mean, great. You know, hopefully uh, lives up to the name and uh, we can, uh, you can cash some money and maybe I'll just join him as well. Because yeah, be, if he's 500 to one, there would be a thousand to one over here. And, uh, we can oh, yeah. And, and that, um, you know, when the DraftKings specific side, you brought it up again, he'll he'll probably be 1%, you know, less than that potentially. And there's 2,000 or 4, 1,470 people in that contest. So South African Open had that similar contest. I, I rostered two golfers of that similar mold in Batista and Casey Jarvis, who's South African amateur. And I was like one of the only people that roster each of them. And I won that contest for the week because of, you know, the low six of sixes and these guys getting getting through and making some noise. And, and those are the opportunities that they don't, especially especially on DraftKings, they do not have to even finish top 20 to give you a return on investment when they're going to be, I mean, DraftKings should be releasing salaries right now. Let's see. Batista's price is 6,100. Yeah. You know, as, as close to the minimum, pretty much as you can get. So um, that to me kind of just puts a bow on, on what we think is going to be ahead of this week. So Tom, let's run down your card one more time. Yeah, so I've got Ashen Wu, I've got Alexander Bjork, David Horsey, Gonzalo Fernandez Castaño, and Ashley Kester, who we obviously both agree on as well. Awesome. And then I will be going, like, like you mentioned, so if we go top down, I will be on for the week. Starting up top will be David Horsey together with you at 60s. Then we'll go into John Catlin at 70. We'll have Sebastian Garcia Rodriguez. He was available right around 100. So you opened 150 if you pulled that one early. He's down almost in the 50s in some spots as well. Um, Darius Van Driel, 150. Andre Lieser, 150. Ashley Chester's with you, Tom, 175. And then Austin Batista, 500 to one, mixed in that top 20 with him as well. So thank you guys all again for tuning in to this week's show for our Austrian Golf Open. Again, you can subscribe on YouTube, please. Uh, this is the European Tour Picks and Bets on Mayo Media Network. Please uh, shoot us a like and subscribe there. And then if you like the audio format, you can uh, look into the podcast on any of your different platforms. This is Daily Fantasy Sports Picks and Bets. The Mix, please feel free to subscribe to that. Follow us on Twitter at SkyhookDFS. Tom, what's your Twitter? Uh, Tom Jacobs 93 and then lost for words. You can find that episode yeah. should be up this evening. Um, you know, where him and Jason go deep alternate shot on my end, a lot of different ways you can find our platforms on, but we're thankful for Pat for offering the opportunity to continue to show the light on the European tour. So thank you guys so much and best of luck this week. Yep, guys, enjoy the events. 